Tonight on this episode of Veterans Voices, we'll be talking with a few of my fellow California Veterans Service Officers about important changes to VA benefits. We're glad you're with us. If you're online, please share this broadcast with your friends, family, and other veterans. We'll be right back. Welcome, I'm Nathan Johnson, the Contra Costa County Veterans Service Officer. The mission of Veterans Voices is to share the community by sharing and discussing veterans' issues and connecting vets and their families to resources. I'm joined by my co-host, Calvet Link, and Gold Star Father, Kevin Graves. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, Kevin. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing good, good to see you. Good to, good to be here. If you're watching tonight and would like to share an experience or ask a question, please send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices 1 or email us at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. Tonight we have the privilege of displaying Derek Spoonie Love's shadow box on our set. Derek served 20 years in the Marine Corps and completed nine combat deployments, five in Iraq and four in Afghanistan. Derek retire, retired from the Wounded Warrior Battalion in 2017 and is now a student at Diablo Valley College studying kinesiology. Kinesiology. There, we got it. Now we would like to welcome our, fir our first guest and the Kern County Veteran Service Officer, jo Joshua Danins, to talk about benefit changes related to the uh, Blue Water Naval Service. Welcome, Joshua. Thanks for having me. Hey, Josh. Uh, thanks for being on the show tonight. Before we start talking about Agent Orange, uh, just give our audience a little bit of understanding of uh, your military background and your work there in Kern County. Okay, I've been with uh, the Kern County Veterans Service Department for about seven years. Uh, prior to that, uh, I did some college, used my GI Bill, um, and I got that benefit by serving about nine years in the U.S. Army. Uh, six and a half was active duty and the rest was reserve. Wow, well thank you so much. Yeah. So tonight's a great opportunity to highlight the role of the County Veterans Service Officer. And uh, County Veterans Service Officers are uh, the resource that veterans turn to for accurate information on VA benefits. So we're going to start off tonight by talking about a significant change that has occurred with the VA in awarding compensation benefits for Vietnam veterans. So let's first start talking about Agent Orange. What, what is Agent Orange and how does a veteran know whether or not they were uh, exposed? So it's a good distinction. So Agent Orange is what is kind of commonly it's a common name for a herbicide that was used primarily in Vietnam and along the DMZ um, in Korea uh, to defoliate, um, so to give our men and women who were fighting there a better chance to uh, see enemy combatants coming in. So it's a defoliant, but Agent Orange is a generic term we use to talk about that defoliant. Um, for veterans to know they've been exposed, um, it's an interesting thing with the VA. The VA has a thing called a presumptive service connection. Okay. So if a veteran was in service in Vietnam on land right now, um, the VA will presume they were exposed to Agent Orange, and if they were in certain units along the DMZ in Korea or certain units in Thailand. Right. So um, the veteran doesn't necessarily have to know whether they were, came into contact with this chemical or not. The VA is going to say, you were exposed if you can show that you served in Vietnam. You got it. Or in Korea or yep. Vietnam. Okay. And that's where the change is coming um, right now. So in the past, for the VA, you had to have had physical contact with the Vietnam landmass. Boots on ground. Boots on ground, exactly right. Um, a recent uh, appeals court decided that the VA has been too narrowly defining the term service in Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, service in the Republic of Vietnam. Um, they've now expanded that to 12 nautical miles off the landmass, so the kind of the, the territorial waters of Vietnam. Okay. So veterans now don't have to have served in country in Vietnam. They don't have to have that boots on ground thing. Um, so Blue Water Navy refers to someone who has served on a Navy ship uh, anywhere within the 12 nautical miles of the shores of Vietnam. Yep. Um, so before we continue, I just want to invite our audience to participate in tonight's conversation. We don't have the opportunity for you to call in tonight, but you can ask a question. Uh, we have Josh Dannins from Kern County, and we're talking so far about Blue Water Agent Orange exposure. So if a veteran believes that they were exposed to Agent Orange or fall within that 12 nautical miles, uh, who should they talk to to find out what the presumptive conditions are and what are some of the most common conditions so for I, those vets? I definitely recommend those veterans come talk to a, their local county veteran service office. Um, 
We are scattered throughout the county in lots of different uh, main offices, and a lot of folks have remote offices. Um, and it, they're a great resource for all of the uh, information that the veterans need about Agent Orange and the conditions that are kind of presumed to be caused by it. Mm -hmm. Some of the more common ones, diabetes type 2 is a big one, um, okay. ischemic heart disease, Parkinson's disease. Um, there are um, a lot of other uh, things that happen because of maybe the diabetes, so neuropathy or retinopathy, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So secondary, secondary conditions. Exactly right. Um, and, 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 if, uh, and if you're not sure whether or not you fit into that category, what should you bring with you to the County Veterans Service Office to help the, the office it's always, facilitate that? It's always great to have a DD-214. If you haven't been to your county office already, uh, bring that DD-214. That can be a good starting place. Um, for the Navy men and women who are on board ships, if they have any records of where their ships may have been or maybe some uh, ship logs or access to those ship logs. Um, the VA has for years been kind of compiling a list of vessels that docked on land or served in inland waterways. Um, I don't think the VA has been doing a good job seeing which ships were within that 12 nautical mile range, right? So um, recently I filed a, a claim for a veteran who had been previously denied because he was not boots on ground. Um, and now the VA is helping develop his claim, and one of the things they're asking for is any information he can provide about his ship. So the VA needs to now look to see if his ship fits in that 12 nautical mile range. Generally, where do they get that information from? How can, how can a veteran establish the fact that their ship served within that range? There are a lot of different ways. Um, the Navy is amazing at keeping records, so they have a lot of good resources for ship logs. This particular veteran... Um, is a part of a Facebook group, and so he was able to talk to the fellow veterans that served on board that ship with him, and they had some printouts that they got from the internet, um, just kind of tracking the movements of their, their ships. Okay. Um, and then NPRC, the National Personnel Records Center, may have some of that documentation as well. So how is the VA processing these claims, and what are they doing for veterans that previously filed for Agent Orange presumptive conditions but were denied because they didn't have boots on the ground? Uh, so. I'll go back just a little bit. So the VA um, had a chance to appeal. They didn't. So during this process, the VA is still trying to figure this stuff out. So um, the last time I heard, the VA is setting aside those blue water um, veteran claims. Um, the decision is a Procopio decision, so that's what they're kind of calling it. And they're putting a flash on that. So when people are filing now who have been previously denied, they're going to get looked at separate from somebody who's filing it for the first time. Okay. Um, but they are going to look at those individual cases now, um, and hopefully we're going to find out more information on how they're going to really kind of start processing this, because it's going to be a lot of veterans who have been denied for years who were filing for claims um, that they are now going to be entitled to. Right. So Procopio versus Wilkie is the case that, yeah. and this is just recently this year that this decision came In about. January, yep. Right, January this year. So um, how does this affect any benefits for surviving spouses? If a veteran died from a presumptive condition, um, how are they affected by this decision? Yeah, that's a, a, a good thing to bring up because we often talk about veterans and we forget about their surviving spouses. So um, if a veteran um, passed away from a condition is one, on the presumptive list, then we can show that that veteran was exposed now either in, uh, on land or in the 12 nautical miles. Um, his or her spouse may be entitled to benefits as well. Um, and then that extends to children too. So it's really important for the spouses of veterans who may have passed or had service in Vietnam and now the, the water is off the coast to come talk to a county veteran service officer. Mm -hmm. and, and is this something that's, uh, that, that you can do right now, or is, is there, is, are they still working out the details, or is it time to get into the office and file those claims? I'd say they can definitely get in, get in and file now. Uh, okay. The VA is not going to not process claims. They may put it off until they decide how they're going to work them specifically, but definitely want to get that claim in as soon as you can, um, and then we'll wait to see how the VA treats effective dates of claims and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But definitely come in as soon as possible. And if you have any question about whether or not it applies to you, go to your Some, county veteran service office because something else may apply to you. Exactly right. Right. Yep. right. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually another question I was wondering is, what does this open up in terms of other VA benefits eligibility? So we've so far talked about disability compensation, right? So a veteran can be awarded a monthly monetary benefit for having one of these presumptive conditions. But what else may they receive now that this is open to um, Blue Water Navy vets? So if a veteran wasn't already in the VA system, this opens up access to VA health care um, okay. that they may not have had access to. Um, there are, depending on the age of the veteran, there may be other benefits. But a big one for the state of California, especially for veterans, um, if they're service-connected, disabled, their dependents can get some education benefits as well. Okay. Um, there's a fee waiver program that the, the state offers veterans. Right. Um, and that's definitely important for veterans to look into. Um, surviving spou or spouse benefits as well with right. education, depending on uh, how severe the disabilities are. So education benefits, health care, compensation, 
Lots of good information happening tonight. We're talking to county veteran service officers about some of the changes, major changes that have occurred within the VA system, things that you may not have been aware of, uh, things that didn't exist maybe just a few months ago. And we're trying to connect you to the County Veterans Service Office Program, who are your local advocates, not only in the state of California, but nationwide, to help you understand and apply for these VA benefits. So if you have a question, if you have a comment, uh, hopefully you're joining us on Facebook. You can call in, or, excuse me, you can't call in tonight, but you can uh, leave that question on Facebook or that comment on Facebook, and we'll address it for you. We, we covered some of the disabilities, the, the most common disabilities, diabetes, you said, heart conditions, um, Parkinson's disease. Where does a veteran find out the full array of what conditions are presumptive and what conditions are not presumptive, but maybe the VA is looking at uh, in terms of maybe a future relationship to exposure to Agent Orange? So definitely always the County Veteran Service Officer is going to be a great resource um, for any veteran or, or their dependents who are looking about this stuff. Um, the VA, uh, VA.gov is also a good resource. Um, they have a complete list of current things that um, are presumptive conditions for exposure to Agent Orange. Um, to the best of my knowledge, some of the more current things they're looking at is, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank now. Oh, no. Hey, anything, uh, can you help me out? <laughs> hypertension, Hyper possibly, I think there's uh, maybe bladder cancer, bladder, maybe yep. Parkinson-like symptoms. So I think the VA is, is studying these conditions just yeah. to see if there might be a relationship. But they're not yet presumptive now. Correct. That's correct. Um, but you mentioned earlier that some of these conditions may be secondary. So uh, if a veteran believes that they have a condition, say, as a result of one of the presumptive conditions, how can they establish, what should they do to establish that? Should they see a VA doctor? Um, should they just come in and file the claim for the secondary condition? What's the best way for them to present that claim successfully to the VA? I think the best way for a veteran to file a claim on secondary conditions is to, one, get diagnosed. You want to make uh -huh. sure you have the condition you're filing for. Okay. Um, and they can do that through a VA doctor. If they're not enrolled in VA healthcare, they can do it through a private doctor as well. Okay. Um, but that just helps strengthen the claim. Um, veterans do not have to do that, right. um, but we certainly encourage them to do that um, once they have that diagnosis and a link to the, the primary condition, coming down to the, the local VSO and filing that claim for right. secondary is the best yeah. way to go about it. We just have a minute here, Josh, and thanks for being on the show. Can you give us an example of a veteran who you've been able to help due to this change or due to the Agent Orange presumptive condition? Obviously, confidentiality sure. is very important. We want to respect that veteran. But can you give us an example of how this Agent Orange presumptive condition has uh, changed a veteran's life? Um, I haven't had the pleasure of getting any claims successfully adjudicated yet. But again, I have worked with two um, already. And again, the VA is developing those claims. So they're actually yeah. looking at helping the veteran with that duty to assist the VA has. So yeah. um, they're reaching out now to the veteran to make sure that their, their ship was in that 12 nautical mile. Yeah. So we're hopeful that, that that's going to be adjudicated quickly um, now that um, everybody has decided not to challenge this decision. Yeah. I know in our office, uh, many of the veteran service reps in our office have helped veterans in this particular case. One, one example that comes to mind for me is a surviving spouse of a veteran who served on a Navy ship that was on the Agent Orange ship list, but it required that the veteran have gone ashore. This Agent Orange Blue Water Navy um, decision is going to change that because now this veteran's service in, within that 12 nautical miles presumes his exposure to Agent Orange. So this veteran, who's, this surviving spouse who's waiting on a claim to be decided by the BVA, is going to be decided favorably and much quicker because of this change. So, Josh, thank you for the work that you do in Kern County, and thank you for your service. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. Thank you for staying with us. Here's an important resource for California veterans. The California Association of County Veterans Service Officers is an organization of professional veterans advocates. In California, the County Veterans Service Officer plays a critical role in the veterans advocacy system and is often the initial contact in the community for veteran services. The CACVSO is committed to providing a vital and efficient system of services and advocacy to veterans, their dependents, and survivors. Find your local veteran service officer by going to CACVSO.org. Are you out there with a question for us? We encourage you to send us a message, be a part of the conversation. We'd love to hear from you. Next up, we had a chance to catch up with Virginia Wimmer, the County Veteran Service Officer for San Joaquin County. Virginia, can you tell us a little bit about your military service? 
Absolutely. So I joined the Air Force. Um, I was about 21 years old uh, from Baltimore, Maryland. First of all, I wanted to see the world and I wanted to finish my education as well. Um, so my first duty station was in Cheyenne, Wyoming um, at a base called Effie Warren Air Force Base. Um, I could not uh, essentially beat all of those cowboys, so I joined them. Um, and I got myself a pair of cowboy boots and a big old buckle and a white shirt, and I became a cowgirl for a few years. Um, fast forward, I retired from Travis Air Force Base after 26 years of active duty service as a senior master sergeant, E-8. And um, from there, I continue, continued serving veterans through the uh, Veteran Service Office in Fairfield, which is the Solano County Veteran Service Office. I was a um, Veteran Service representative for about two years. And my boss, Ted Pantillo, said, you know what, Virginia, I don't think I'm going to teach you much more about being a Veteran Service rep. It's time for you to fly, my little butterfly. Go and be a County Veteran Service Officer in San Joaquin County. And here I am. Congratulations. Yeah, that's very well deserved. Thank you. So what inspires you to continue helping veterans in your community? What is what is what energizes you to do this work? This work is uh, a win-win situation, right? I get to meet veterans. I get to meet heroes almost every day. And a lot of times those heroes are looking for just a little bit help, just a little bit of hope. And I'm able to provide that hope for them. I'm able to help them navigate that VA system. And so what inspires me to keep going, I like to tell people I love legally extorting money from the Department of Veterans Affairs. So if there is a benefit to be sought, I am the person to help them seek those benefits. Can we air that footage of you saying that? I don't see why not. It's legal. It's legal. She said legal. Um, what advice would you give to a young veteran out there watching our program, Veterans Voices, and in terms of uh, successfully transitioning to civilian life? First of all, I would tell a young um, service member, while you're on active duty, start preparing for your civilian transition. That's first and foremost. Um, we can't wear that uniform forever. Get ready. There is life after the military, and if you need help, go see a county veteran service officer. Um, we are trained to speak VA. We are trained to read medical records to determine what could be filed for, for disabilities. We are trained to help them navigate the system. Um, they don't have to go at it alone. But the first step is start preparing while you're on active duty. Get yourself ready to transition. So that's, what I, that's the advice I would give them. What's the hardest part about transition in your mind? Um, I would say, um, if I'm allowed to speak for most veterans, if not all, I would say just that, having to take off the uniform and then wearing your civilian clothes, having to figure out what is my next step, where do I go from here. The hardest part is letting go of that uh, military life. That's hard. Um, there's nothing easy about that transition. We think we're ready, we think we are prepared until the day comes when we uh, transition out, when we retire, um, or when we uh, separate through length of service and then we realize, oh wait, there is no first sergeant. There is no captain. There's no commanding officer. Um, you are now essentially the captain, the commanding officer of your, your destiny. So you need, you need a wingman. You need a county veteran service officer to help you get, get through that process. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. What is uh, maybe one of your funniest stories from boot camp or military service? Oh, wow. Well, if I go back to basic training, one of the most embarrassing things that ever happened to me was uh, I was in basic training. And in the Air Force, they force you to keep in touch with your loved ones at home. Well. I loved sleeping, so when it was time, when we had that downtime, I would take a nap. Well, I had missed a few letters home to my mother, um, who was at the time a single mom, and I missed those letters, and my mother called basic training. And she called my commanding officer and said, I hadn't heard from my daughter in two weeks, and I'm concerned. And so they came and got me out of the barracks, took me down to QC, and made me call home. And I was essentially verbally reprimanded for not keeping in touch with my mom. So here, here's, a, here's a story to all our new folks. When you go in, if they tell you to write home, please just write home. It's real simple. Take five minutes. Hello, mom, dad, I'm okay. Otherwise, your mom or your dad might call basic training. Right. That's never good. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that video. This is Veterans Voices. And now we're here with Susie Vinci to learn more about the VA's disability pension and death pension changes. 
Susie is the Veteran Service Officer for Placer County. Welcome, Susie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks Excited for being to be here. here. Thanks. Absolutely. Before we start talking about the pension, which there's lots to talk about, yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about your military service and about your role with Placer County. Sure. So I started out as an active Naval Reservist, did that for about four years, went on active duty for six and a half, was a recruiter, went, dropped back into the active reserve, and then I found myself as a VSO. And here I sit. <laughs> well, thank you for your service. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, veterans oftentimes hear about the pension program um, from the VA or from a care facility, uh, but this is the opportunity for the, our audience to learn about the pension program from a CVSO and from a county that has a lot of expertise in this benefit. So um, it's known as on the street sometimes as aid in attendance. Uh, sometimes people say, I get my military pension. Sure. But what is, this, what is this program really called, and, and what, what is it really designed to serve the need for? So the pension program is designed for war-era veterans. Um, there are some eligibility requirements that need be met. Um, 65 years old, served at least 30 days, 90 days active duty, or 90 days active duty, one day of war period, mm -hmm. if before um, 1980. Right. After 1980, it's um, 24 months continuous service, or if it's less than 24 months, they had to have served the full complete term of that service. So it's an in income-based program, which means that um, you have to meet a certain income criteria, whether it be a single veteran or a married veteran. They also consider your assets. Some of those changes to the pension program were in the income so they've increased the income eligibility, and then they've also increased the assets. Okay. So essentially this program sounds like it's to guarantee a, a wartime veteran a, a minimum amount of income per month, right? A certain amount of money to live off of should they be destitute and in a situation which they're in long-term care or homeless and, and unemployed or something. Absolutely. Okay. So it's designed for those veterans who are on a limited income. Mm -hmm. Should those veterans end up finding themselves with physical disabilities that render them incapable of caring for themselves, the additional benefits on top of the aid in, uh, on top of the pension, which is aid in attendance and housebound, those are additional monies paid to the veteran who are paying out of their pocket for care, those care services. Okay, so you mentioned a veteran has to be a wartime veteran. Do they have to have served in war? No, they right. do not have to have had actual combat or wartime service. They just had to have served during the war era. Okay. So if they're going to pay out these, or if they're given this money to offset care costs, can family members be part of those care costs? In other words, could a husband, or could a wife of a husband be uh, part of that, uh, that compensation that they receive for their care? Can they, be, can they qualify for that care? Okay, so to clarify, are you meaning can the veteran pay the family member yes. and use that to reduce their income to be reimbursed for those? Would they be reimbursed for that care cost? If it's paid out legitimately, yeah. sure. I mean, if there's a, they're going to have to account for their, um, for their incoming and their outgoing monies. Okay. So there's at least a, a three-year look-back period in order to be able to um, qualify for this. The VA can look back at least up to three years. Yeah as far as assets and income are concerned. So I guess what I'm understanding here is that this is a benefit paid directly to the veteran, not paid to a caregiver. Um, Correct. And for the death pension benefit, it's paid directly to the surviving spouse. Correct. Okay. And so um, how does the VA calculate the math of this benefit? Because it sounds like you have to report your income, you have to report your assets. How does a veteran report that to the VA? And how does the VA calculate who's eligible for a pension or who's not? So the first step would be to contact your county VSO, County Veteran Service Officer. Mm -hmm. um, talk to a claims rep at your local County Veteran Service Office. There is an actual um, form that the veteran and family members must fill out, or if the veteran is um, in a care facility, the care facility actually, there's a, a section of it that the care facility has to, actually has to fill out and sign that discusses how much they're paying for it, and there's certain things that are not, um, it has to be medically related, so it can't be the cost of, you know, bathing supplies. It has mm -hmm. to be medically related. Okay. 
We have a question here on Facebook that I want to address. It really actually has to do with our previous segment on service connection, but maybe we can answer the question together. Sure. The question is from someone anonymous, and they say, what is considered a secondary condition? Do you want to address that? I'd be happy to as well. Sure. So a secondary condition is the veteran has to be service connected for a condition first, mm -hmm. whether it be the diabetes mellitus type 2, whether it be a back condition, mm -hmm. whether it be... Um, patellofemoral syndrome in the knee. Mm -hmm. um, let's just take the back for instance. A lot of people have back injuries and they get service connected for their back, but a secondary condition that um, ends up developing as a result of that back injury could be some numbness and tingling down one of their lower extremities, down the right leg or the left leg. That would be considered a secondary condition. Okay, so a condition that was caused by or aggravated by that primary condition, yeah. it can be secondary, okay. Sure. Uh, we have another question here from Vincent from San Ramon, and I want to thank our audience for participating in the conversation tonight. We're kind of started off talking about the pension program here, but we're <laughs> shifting slightly based on the questions, but this is good. So Vincent from San Ramon says, do county veteran service officers coordinate with local cities to identify homeless camps and find eligible veterans? So thank you, Vincent, for the question. I could talk a little bit about Contra Costa County if you want to talk a little bit about Placer sure, County. Right. Maybe since you're a link, you work with other counties as well. So. Uh, one of the major events that we do in Contra Costa County on an annual basis, we do it in two different locations, is a stand down. Uh, East Bay stand down happens um, uh, down in Alameda at the Alameda County Fairgrounds, and then uh, stand down on the Delta takes place at the Contra Costa uh, Fairgrounds. So this is a four day event that every year takes veterans off of the street, uh, houses them, provides them with health care, three square meals a day. Uh, showers and brand new clothes. It's a way to help that veteran restore their dignity. So county, our county veteran service office is actively involved. We actually set up our shop at the stand down so we can sit down across from a veteran, help them understand the, the program like disability pension because a lot of veterans who are homeless don't have any source of income. If they serve during a wartime period, if they have a total and permanent disability, right. if they're over age 65, we can have them leave stand down with at least a minimum amount of income every, every month coming from the VA. So what, what about Placer County or other counties? So Placer County participates. As a matter of fact, we just participated um, last month. And we actually set up shop. We had our computer out there. We were um, discussing benefits with veterans. Uh, we did file some intents, meaning that uh, some of the veterans that came out, they were looking to file a claim. And we're in the fact gathering stages. So we sent some paperwork to the VA to let them know that, hey, we're going to be filing a claim in a little while. We're just working on it right now. So please save this date as right. that date of claim. Yeah. Um, we did work some, signed off some driver's license verifications. So okay. we, so there were some of the veterans out there that we were able to give them that So form. a veteran can get the word on, uh, a veteran can have the word veteran placed on their driver's license you rather bet. than carrying around their DD-214? Yeah. And I think another important uh, part of the stand downs is the fact that the, the county also supports with legal care to allow the judges there to be able to take care of some of the misdemeanors and some of the pesky charges that, that a veteran may have against them. Right. Uh, the the uh, state of California is uh, Cal Betts there to support that as well. And I think we collaborate with a lot of the community uh, partners that we have that all get together. Right. And so it's, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort from a lot of different uh, resources within the county. There's some yeah. pretty extensive medical and dental benefits that they end up being able to take advantage of too. So they can get their teeth cleaned, they can yeah. get some simple medical things taken right. care of. Good. Well, I'm glad we got to talk about veterans who are homeless. And I know that this is a problem statewide. LA County was talking about how large their veteran population who's on the streets is. And it's a big problem. And the pension program is not only a program that I think we want our veterans who are low income to know about, but also our veterans who are in long-term care who are incurring significant long-term care costs. So thank you so much. We're out of time. It goes by quickly. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I appreciate so, you having me. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Susie, appreciate you being on the show. And we'll talk to you more later on tonight. Look forward to it. The California Department of Veterans Affairs, CalVet, works to serve California veterans and their families. With nearly 1.8 million veterans living in the state, CalVet strives to ensure that the veterans of every era and their families get the state and federal benefits and services they have earned and deserve as a result of selfless and honorable military service. CalVet strives to serve veterans and their families with dignity and compassion and to help them achieve the highest quality of life. Please visit CalVet at calvet.ca.gov. Next up, Sean Stevens, the Veteran Service Officer from Marin County, shared a bit about his military service and what inspires him to continue serving veterans. Let's watch. 
So Sean, you're the Veteran uh, Service Officer in Marin County? Yes, I am, yes. I, uh, for 12,000 veteran population, yes. Wonderful. So could you share with us perhaps a, uh, how you got to your military service, how you, you chose sure. your, your uh, experience perhaps? Absolutely, so uh, I used to work for the state of Arizona. I did uh, welfare fraud interviews and uh, Minister Welfare Benefits, and prior to that, Child Support Enforcement. Uh, so I had my state ID badge on one day. I was 36 years old in 2006, and I'm at the grocery store, and on the other side of the deli counter was a uh, Arizona National Guard recruiter. And he uh, asked me, he said, uh, y y uh, have you ever thought about joining the uh, Arizona National Guard? You could double up on your retirement benefits. I was like, oh, I think I'm too fat and too old for that. He goes, well, how old are you? And I said, I'm, I'm 36. He goes, oh, I can get you a waiver for that. And uh, so I started looking into it, and um, it, was, it seemed like a, a good idea. And uh, so I went to basic training and uh, got out in uh, October 2006 from Fort Benning basic training. I went uh, infantry and uh, deployed to Afghanistan right away, uh, three months later. Yeah, so it was an amazing kind of uh, situation. It just, um, that's how I got in. So uh, how long were you in Afghanistan? So I did uh, four uh, tours in Afghanistan. Uh, so I spent just right at about three years um, on active duty uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I, de I deployed with my uh, Arizona National Guard unit, the 29th IB. And then uh, I came home for a few weeks and I was able to catch another deployment uh, as a single soldier augmentee with the 101st. And then uh, with the 25th, uh, 4th BCT out of Alaska, I did two, two uh, tours with them. So with all of your experience prior to your military service and all of your experience in your military service, what can you share perhaps with all that wealth that, that you're able to give as the veteran service officer, all that experience? We could share some things. Sure, so, um, you know, whatever you believe in, you know, the higher power, whatever, I mean, there's nothing where I said, oh, you know what, I'm gonna be a welfare worker or social worker. But uh, I got into that field uh, by happenstance and, uh, and the plan was, I guess, for me to learn about doing paperwork and, and learning about talking to people about who, who are in need. And then next thing I know, uh, my higher power is sending me to the Army and uh, to Afghanistan. And then coming home and, um, and, and having a new set of problems, in not only uh, 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 physically, but mentally as well, and learning that... Um, how to work with veterans. I mean, it was just, it just is such a, a plan that there's no way that I could have ever come up with that on my own. And uh, so working that paperwork part that I learned in the welfare offices and child support enforcement, uh, going through the military and learning how that system works, and then using the V, being a, a user of the VA as well, medical and everything head to toe, um, it really helped me to, uh, to learn about what veterans are needing, what a veteran is, and, and how to connect with them. Oh, that's, that's tremendous. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're joined now by Mike Hofschneider to talk about the Appeals Modernization Act. Mike is a veteran service representative here in Contra Costa County, and we're very happy to have him on our program tonight. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Nathan. Glad to be here. Absolutely. And just as we have with other guests, right. let's start off talking about first your military service okay. and then your continued uh, community service uh, with the VA. All right. Well, I'm an Army veteran. I served in the late 60s. Went to school under the GI Bill following service. Got a job at the Department of Veterans Affairs in 1974, and I retired in 2004 as a veterans claims examiner. 2005, I went to work in Contra Costa County, and I've been there for the last 14 and a half years. A rumor has it you were a drill sergeant in the Army. Uh, there's truth to that rumor. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. Good. Well, thank you so much. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Appeals Modernization Act is a um, long-awaited change mm -hmm. uh, that the VA has recently implemented um, within the past several months. Mm -hmm. I think February of this year. February 19th. February 19th, to be exact. Mm -hmm. So um, let's start off with just understanding first why, do, why would a veteran want to appeal a decision from the VA? What might they disagree with that would, be a, would, that would in, entice them to make a decision to pursue uh, an appeal through the, the, new, the new act? 
Well, I think, I think I'd answer that question by saying the vast majority of appeals involve the program you were talking about earlier, and that's disability compensation, mm -hmm. which is a program for veterans who have disabilities they believe are related to service. Right. Any veteran can file a claim for disability compensation for any disability, but they have to have evidence to show they've got the disability and evidence to link it back to a disease, injury, or events in service. Mm -hmm. So 99% of those appeals that go up to the highest level of the VA, which is the Board of Veterans Appeals, involve disability compensation. It's either because the VA says the disability is not due to service or the VA says the disability is at this level and the veteran feels at a higher level. Okay. So when the, veteran, when the VA is saying this disability is not related to your service, mm -hmm. Are they, is, is that kind of a subjective, arbitrary determination? Are they saying, well, we really don't really believe that this happened to you? Or is it based on facts found from, say, service medical records? It's, it's based on the veteran's claim, specific disability, and it's based on the facts that the VA has in front of them, which they gather from the veteran service medical records. If there's treatment records, either VA or private, they pull those, they should pull those in. And in many cases, they have the veteran examined. For example, the veteran may have a disability they want to claim. When they examine them, they don't find any residual disability there. They would deny service connection for them. Okay. So, uh, and then you say the veteran may disagree with the way the VA evaluates that condition. Right. So if the veteran says, this is worse than what you're evaluating me, right. so, for example, the veteran gets a rating of 10% for tinnitus, and they think the tinnitus is worse than 10%, right. uh, would that be an example of something that they would appeal to the VA? It's, they have the right to appeal it, but as I would t advise a veteran, and I would show them what the rules are, the rule is tinnitus is a 10% disability. That is a maximum valuation the VA can assign. So you can appeal it, but as I tell veterans, your chances of success are not very good. So the VA is basically working with a playbook here. Right. A rule. A, a, a rule of what's called a schedule for rating disabilities, federal laws, federal regulations. Okay. So it's not necessarily a personal decision oh, no. that the oh, VA no, is making. Oh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. Um, okay, so the veteran gets to a point which they disagree with the VA's decision. Mm -hmm. um, they come to a county veteran service office, as we've mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, how does this Appeals Modernization Act change what they can anticipate in terms of uh, applying for an appeal or a notice of disagreement with the VA? Well, in the past, there was one avenue that you would, you would follow on an appeal, and you had to go through a process of filing a notice of disagreement. The VA would issue a statement of the case. You had to file a substantive appeal. If there was additional evidence, they would issue a supplemental statement of the case. The case would finally find its way to the Board of Veterans' Appeals. This process, because of the multiple reviews and the time lag involved, would take five to seven years. Okay. The it appeals sounds like very linear, too. Right. Okay. One, one lane, I guess you could call it, because mm -hmm. the VA's now got what's called an Appeals Modernization Act. And what it really is is a, is a decision review modernization. So now there's three avenues, or three lanes, as the VA calls them, to, to come back and ask the VA to reconsider that decision. The first lane is called a supplemental review. The veteran has to provide new and relevant evidence, and then the VA is going to look at that, and they're going to make a decision. And their goal is to do that in 125 days. Let's stop there real quickly. New relevant evidence, what does that mean? It means it's new, the VA hasn't seen it before, and it means it's relevant. For example, the, the example I used earlier, the veteran have, has an exam, they don't find a disability. If the veteran can provide the VA with evidence to show they've got that disability and it's linked to service, that's going to be relevant evidence that the VA can reconsider and possibly change that decision on. Okay. So that's the supplemental claim lane. That's a supplemental claim lane. That applies to all decisions now, whether it was made after February 19th or prior to. Okay. So if they've previously denied it, they've got to file a supplemental claim. Lane two is a higher level review. And if they want to file a higher level review claim, that's going to be reviewed at one of two decision review operation centers around the country. It's going to be reviewed by what's called a decision review officer or a senior claims examiner. Okay. Okay. And if they're, again, they, they're going to make that decision in 125 days. That's their goal. Doesn't mean they'll do it, but that's what they're striving to do. Do they get a chance to talk to this decision review officer? They can, they they sit can, down they can, they can have an informal telephone conference with their representative present okay. in, in either of these steps. Okay. And then the third lane is where they can take their case directly to the Board of Veterans' Appeals. Okay. And what, what's complicated about the new law, and in some ways it's been sold as a simplification, it's not really because when you get to the Board of Veterans' Appeals, now you've got three lanes you can possibly use. Mm. One is you can go and ask for a direct review based on the evidence the VA has. The second lane at the Board of Veterans' Appeals, you can ask for a direct review, but you have additional evidence that you're going to submit within the next 90 days. And then the third lane is you can ask for a, a direct review, you've got some additional evidence, and by the way, I want to talk to a, the judge that's going to make the decision on my case. The time frame the VA has there has a goal of one year. So we're talking about moving from a th five to seven year process to hopefully a four months, four months, or one year process. Okay. Well, this is a lot. 
It is. Yeah. I don't know how the public is really receiving yeah. this, but the intent here is is what? To essentially make the process faster, easier for the veteran? Right. Well, I'm not sure if it's going to be easier, yeah. but I, it's, it's supposed to make it faster. faster. That's the idea behind it. Because the burden of proof still lies yeah. uh, on the veteran. He still has yeah. to have the documentation. Yeah. He still has to provide yeah. the same information. You know, there's a misconception in some veterans. They think it's up to the VA to prove their claim for them. That, that's a misconception. Mm -hmm. The burden of proof is on the veteran. The VA will assist. In fact, they will bend over backwards to assist under what was referred to earlier as the duty to assist. But it's really up to the veteran. And that's why it's important for the veteran, if they're not sure how to proceed in these cases, and these cases can be complex, is to seek out counsel from folks like us, okay. veteran service representatives. So what can a county veteran service officer do to help a veteran that's trying to put these things together? The most important thing we can do is explain to the veteran what benefits and services that are available to them, explain what the rules are, and those are the laws and the regulations and the precedent decisions of the courts that, that apply to their All case, right. and identify the key facts that the VA is going to need to establish their entitlement to the benefit. And we can also assist them navigate this new decision modernization review process. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we really can do is help the veteran kind of avoid the appeals process altogether. Yeah. yeah. You know, if a veteran has been denied a uh, discharge, uh, yeah. an upgrade in their amount of service connection compensation, yeah. it's likely because the medical evidence shows that condition exists within that certain level. Mm -hmm. And the veteran's going to want to appeal that decision because they disagree with it. But what we can help the veteran understand is that a medical provider can complete a disability benefits questionnaire, mm -hmm. can provide a statement, or the veteran can seek treatment and have that treatment documented in their private records or their VA CPRS records and present that evidence to the VA for a reconsideration <clears throat> of that claim. So I think we can help the, I think in my instance, I like to help the veteran avoid the appeals process and just understand by educating them how the VA makes the decisions that they make. I often think that the fact that that playbook, these, these regulations are available to the public mm -hmm. helps them understand that this is not a secret. There, there's nothing here that we, that's a guessing game and it's not a personal process, it's a, it's a legal process. So Absolutely. We just have about 30 seconds here, so mm -hmm. we haven't covered really everything, but what, what would you tell a veteran who is thinking that they need to appeal a decision the VA made and that appeal has been recently made? How, how should they come prepared to move that appeal forward? Well, if they've been in our office before, we, we're going to have information on that. We're also going to have access to their electronic record, where we should have, mm -hmm. where we can actually review documentation. We're in a much better position. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been in before, you need to bring that documentation in. One of the things we're going to ask you to do is sign a representation form, and after a few weeks, we're going to have access to your electronic record where we can go in and look at what the VA has, what they've done. Is there a timeline? Is there a timeline? The timeline for appeals in the vast majority of cases is an exception, like most of the VA programs, but it's a one-year period from the date you're notified okay. to initiate that appeal. Otherwise, that decision becomes what's called a finally adjudicated claim. So don't take your time. Act quickly. Bring any medical evidence that may support the right. fact that this decision made by the VA is incorrect. Absolutely. Mike, I want to appreciate right. you for your service mm -hmm. and for your continued uh, help to four veterans at the VA in both for Contra Costa County. Thanks for summarizing this as best you could in 11 minutes. <laughs> Boy, it was a mouthful, but uh, really appreciate your expertise on this benefit. Thank so you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank the you. Department of Veterans Affairs is tasked with fulfilling President Lincoln's promise to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan by serving and honoring the men and women who are American veterans. They are also here to provide veterans the world-class benefits and services they have earned, and to do so by adhering to the highest standards of compassion, commitment, and excellence. Learn more about the VA by going to va.gov. We'll be right back to talk about more changes to VA benefits. Please enjoy this interview with Jason Cameron, County Veteran Service Officer for Monterey County. So Jason, you're the County Veteran Service Officer for Monterey County? I sure am, yeah. Maybe you could share with us a little bit about your military service, some of your experiences. Absolutely. So uh, I uh, joined the Marine Corps in 1993. I uh, got out in 97. I did four years uh, active duty in the Marine Corps. And then I had a, a, actually a 12-year break in service um, and then ended up joining the Army National Guard. So it, had, you know, it took me 12 years to get over the Marine Corps uh, yeah. and, uh, before I joined the Guard. So uh, and did that as a part-time uh, thing. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. And how did you get to becoming a veteran service officer? You know, it's, uh, it was kind of a transition. Um, I ended up, when I was in the National Guard, I ended up working uh, part-time uh, for the National Guard and then worked full-time for the State Military Department helping veterans. And that was where I really found that I had a, a, a desire to really help 
our service members transition into civilian uh, employment. And then I saw the needs for all the other benefits that are also there for veterans. And, and there wasn't really a handoff. And so I saw an opening with uh, Monterey County, ended up uh, applying for the job and got the job. And have been there for a little over a year. And I've, I've just, I am just been delighted uh, being able to help these veterans uh, connect to the, to the benefits that are out there for them and really creating that awareness. So if you can point maybe one or two or more things that really through your military training has really been able to, to kind of help you, like you've already mentioned, but any additional ones connect with those veterans in the community? Absolutely. Well, for me personally, you know, being active duty uh, as well as being National Guard um, really kind of gave me a, a full scope and, and, a, and an array of uh, awareness and really understanding what benefits are there for each category of veteran. And then also for me personally, being somebody who was older when I joined the National Guard and then and had to work a civilian career in conjunction with that, um, really kind of helped me be able to relate a lot with, uh, with the whole demographic group uh, within the, the veteran space. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And as we always ask, can you think on top of your head of a funny situation maybe in boot camp or something mm. that kind of... <laughs> Uh, Marine Corps boot camp wasn't very funny, um, <laughs> okay. so, so there's that, but um, something that was kind of, I guess, funny in a weird way was um, some mandatory fun. So when I was in Japan, there was some mandatory fun. It was uh, hiking to the top of Mount Fuji. And so you could either go do that or stay back and clean uh, latrines. <laughs> okay. So we, I elected the mandatory fun. Understood. And by the time I got to the top of Mount Fuji, it was time to turn around and run down to catch the bus. So I literally got to the top, couldn't take a breath, and turned around and ran back down. So that, that, like that was it. Fun. Oh, it was, it was absolutely, yeah, yeah, 20 years okay. ago now, so. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Right. Welcome back. Now Ryan Kegley is here with us to talk about the Mission Act. Ryan is the County Veteran Service Officer in Stanislaus County. And we're also joined by Scott Holwell, the current president of the California Association of County Veteran Service Officers. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. It's an honor to be here tonight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so exciting to, to not only talk about the Mission Act, but now to tie everything back to the County Veteran Service Office, how County Veteran Service Officers can be advocates for veterans. So um, before we start talking about the Mission Act, real quickly, Ryan, give us a summary of your military service and your continued community service in San Jose County. Uh, I joined the Army in uh, 1996 as a combat engineer, uh, served my enlistment, and then when I got out of the military, used my Montgomery GI Bill uh, to go to school, uh, started working for a county welfare department. Uh, and then a position opened up at the County Veteran Service Office, and I've been there uh, about three years. Great. Thanks. Scott? Uh, I started off my military service in 1981, ended in 2011. I served in the Navy for 30 years, uh, took a little break uh, for about two years making cheese uh, for a large cheese-making corporation, uh, and then found myself at the County Veteran Service Office, and I've been there for five years. Sounds cheesy. So... Uh, <laughs> The Mission Act, you know, the, the VA somewhat was brought into the spotlight a couple years ago uh, when one of the uh, medical centers had this list um, that was not enrolling veterans within a reasonable amount of time. So right. if we kind of back the calendar up a couple of years, we'll really understand that the Mission Act and previous to that, the Choice Act, was, I think, an effort by the community to say that we need to provide health care for our veterans in a better way. Correct. But that's the purpose of it, but what really is the Mission Act and what does it provide for veterans who are enrolled in the VA health care system? Well, like you said, it's a, it's a new VA law that uh, makes several changes to a variety of VA programs. Uh, the most important of which, though, like you, like you mentioned, is the ability and, and access for veterans to be able to utilize medical care within their communities outside of the VA health care system. Private providers? Private providers. Okay. Uh, in, in Stanislaus County, where I, where I work, uh, we are very geographically distant from a uh, VA hospital. Uh, okay. Palo Alto is about two hours away. Mm. Sacramento, also about two hours away. And then Fresno, about two hours away. Okay. Uh, got a community-based outpatient clinic uh, in, in our area. Um, it's open Monday through Friday from, from 8 to 5 o'clock. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we see in our community uh, is access to emergency care, urgent care. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that the Mission Act is going to allow is veterans to utilize uh, urgent care within the community. Uh, the certain number of visits that they're gonna be able to utilize, 
A couple of very important keys to that, though. The veteran has to be enrolled in uh, VHA, uh, and they have to have been treated by VHA within the last 24 months. Uh, the other stipulation is that they have to use an urgent care that's in the, in, in the Mission Act network or the VA network. Yeah, so I, you were talking about Stanislaus County being like that, but, but really you speak for a lot of the rural area, which is a, a good portion of Northern California Absolutely. and Eastern California, which has this same dilemma and these same challenges. And they're finally starting to address those programs with the, with the medical centers only going as high as Sacramento. The entire Northern Absolutely. California has that same kind of challenge. Absolutely. Uh, Stanislaus County isn't even that rural. We right. have uh, rural portions of our county. Uh, we've got neighboring counties in Calaveras and Tuolumne that are even further distanced from uh, our, our home hospital in Palo Alto, so three to four hours to, to access that that hospital. So you mentioned uh, the veteran must be enrolled in the VA healthcare system. Scott, can you say a little bit about where that process starts for a veteran? Well, uh, that's a good question, Nathan. The process can start in several different places. Uh, where the county veteran service offices are concerned, uh, that process can start with us. We can help the veteran to actually uh, file that application uh, for, uh, for health care, or they can be directed either to a community-based outpatient clinic, which are often referred to as CBOCs. Uh, and the CBOC uh, can actually look up their eligibility uh, instantly as well as they can do that same process, engage in that at a VA hospital. So a very simple application, a copy of their DD-214 and a referral to the local VA clinic can get them enrolled. And then once they're enrolled, what you're saying is if the VA can't provide them with adequate care, they can seek that care in the community through either urgent care or through primary care. Can they, can they seek uh, behavioral health or mental health through the private community as well? Uh, my understanding up to this point is that the VA wants to keep, uh, keep mental health within the VA system. Okay. Um, one of the other challenges I was going to mention, uh, again, in, in Stanislaus County, is the ability to, to get and, and keep medical providers at our, at our clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other things that the Mission Act is going to allow are uh, retention and, and recruitment tools. Um, the ability to uh, have student loan forgiveness, uh, there's going to be dental and medical scholarships for students to go to school, uh, and then they would um, opt to work in the VA healthcare system to, to meet that requirement or, or satisfy that, okay. that commitment. That commitment, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. What about specialty care? What about um, seeing a heart doctor or seeing a chiropractor or any other type of non-primary care type? And that's, that's one of the big, biggest benefits is that most of that specialized care is at the uh, hospital level. Um, and so the ability to utilize those providers within the community is going to be a, a great benefit. Uh, one of the other deals is um, uh, women's health. Um, we, had a, we had a female veteran that came in. Um, her obstetrician appointment was in Livermore. Uh, uh -huh. It's about an hour and a half drive away. Uh, she had a high-risk pregnancy um, and wasn't able to make those appointments, uh, but because it was a high-risk pregnancy, the local providers were uh, reluctant to bring her on. Mm. Um, and so there were, there were some challenges there with, uh, with the way that the CHOICE program uh, was working, uh, and our hope is that the Mission Act is going to alleviate some of the, those uh, limitations for her. When is this being implemented, or is it currently implemented, or is it just in the rollout process right uh, now? It, it's currently implemented. It uh, took effect June 6th of this year. Okay. Um, the VA is still uh, in process of uh, coordinating the infrastructure and the, the procedure to get everything going. Um, but at this point, veterans are able to, to opt into that program. So, Scott, uh, we're talking about the Mission Act. We're talking about VA health care. We've talked about compensation, pension. When a veteran visits a county veteran service office with the intent of learning about the VA health care system, how does the CVSO facilitate helping that veteran maybe with the whole full array of VA benefits that might be available to them? You know, Nathan, it's, it's a process uh, of sitting down and becoming uh, comfortable with the veteran, the veteran becoming comfortable with the, the veteran service representative. And, and like I said, it's a process about learning about that veteran, finding out what that veteran's experiences are, looking through their record, their medical record, their service record, finding out where they may have been, and then making recommendations based on the interview, uh, what uh, information has come out uh, from the veteran uh, that they've self-reported, what's been in their records, um, and then moving forward uh, with filing those claims. Yeah, I know in our office a veteran comes in and maybe has heard from someone that they 
and get some free hearing aids from the VA. So they come down to our office and that's what they're asking for. Come to find out that they served in Vietnam. So we review Agent Orange presumptive conditions with them. Mm -hmm. The VA provides a special enhanced eligibility for them to enroll in VA healthcare. So really kind of exploring this veteran's history of military service is what I'm hearing. And, and maybe what has incurred, what maybe occurred to them during that service opens up the door for them to not only receive VA health care, but possibly disability compensation as well. It absolutely does. You know, my predecessor in the office uh, used to tell us that often folks will walk through our doors thinking that they want bananas and oranges and they end up mm. leaving with, with apples and pineapples mm. that they really needed, but they didn't know yeah. that they actually needed. And so that's our job is, is to determine that need, to find out what that need is with that yeah. veteran. And we do that by building that relationship. Uh, and then seeing how we can help the veteran and, and, and what it is that they need. Well, well let me say, a kind of, thank you for that information, Scott, and, that, and thank you both for being on the show here tonight. But let me just say something as the only person at this table all night, as well as probably the only person in this room that's not a county veteran service officer, that what I learned tonight is that you guys have a tremendous wealth of information. And I believe that any veteran out there that does not take advantage of their county veteran service office and come in and find out what, where the apples and oranges are, that they're, that they're doing themselves a disservice. And I would encourage anybody out there listening tonight or watching tonight to, um, to do that, to go to your county veteran service office, even if you've been before. Maybe you've been frustrated by a previous uh, contact with the VA. Go in and find out what you deserve and, and let these people help you out because they are a wealth of information. Right. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, All Kevin. You. Thank you, gentlemen. We're out of time. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on the homepage later this week or check your cable provider schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on, your, on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa. So, so be sure to subscribe. Our next live broadcast will be Monday, July 22nd at 7 p.m. Be sure to tune in. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa County signing off, wishing you all a relaxing evening. And for the veterans out there, Air Force, Hoorah! Army, Hoorah! Marines, Hoorah! Navy, Go Navy! Thank you very much. Good night. Go